One Square Mile, Texas, is brought to you by Southwest Airlines, flying the Texas skies since 1971, and community partners in square miles from coast to coast. Southwest Airlines is proud to support One Square Mile, Texas. More information at southwest.com. Texas Photo Montage, featuring the cultural images of Texas, available online at texasmontage.com. Texas is an interesting place, and uh, I think I identify most with Dallas. I don't think I found my tribe until I got here. We're seven miles from the border, so you get a little bit of everything. You'd be surprised what goes on in a little town. When you enact, they all make sure that you're okay and safe. If you go to a restaurant, plan on a two-hour wait. I'm living in a city where things are vibrant. Here, I just feel like I'm in the right spot. We're in a cultural explosion, influenced by this community. My name is Lewis Black. I'm one of the founders and directors of South by Southwest. I started the Austin Chronicle with my partner, Nick Barbro, and that's been for 32 years. And we started South by Southwest with no money. We started in the cash flow of the Chronicle, and as I like to say, cash flow of the Chronicle at that point was euphemistic. The whole idea behind South by Southwest all along was to support independent music. And now it's film and it's new media. And I really think that we profoundly influenced not only Austin, Texas, but the, the country in a lot of ways. The electricity in the air is amazing. The amount of energy is amazing. I've been blessed in how much stuff I've gotten to do. It's interesting because I'm clearly at the end of a series of chapters and I'm not sure what's next and it's, I'm a little scared. In November of 2011, I had congestive heart failure. During that, they discovered a wound on the bottom of my foot. They had to take off my big toe. Almost immediately, I developed new wounds and they had to amputate the rest of my toes. For decades, it was just full speed ahead. And all of a sudden, you slam to a halt. Your life comes to a halt. So I spent months and months and months and months off my feet. And I spent a lot of time lying on a couch with a foot in the air watching television. So a lot of the things that I used to do, other people have taken over. So day to day, I don't really have a clear role. I'm very frustrated. I spend a lot of time being very, very frustrated because I don't feel very happy or very fulfilled right now. I'm used to being more of an old timer guy in the background. Out of the 4,000 volunteers, many of them have no idea who I am. I have to introduce myself. On Wednesday night, there was the 20th anniversary screening of Dazed and Confused. And sitting in that audience, I was the same kid who saw that movie 20 years ago. And uh, I was the same kid I was when I went through some of those experiences 20 years before that. I was so passionate. I was so driven. And right now, I'm passionate, but I'm just not driven. My level of intimacy is different. It's more like I relate to it as a bunch of grandkids rather than, you know, a kid in a way. It's getting the inner gyroscope working again. It's getting my bearings again. For years and years and years, for decades, if I wanted to do something, we went and did it. I certainly am proud of South by Southwest and the Chronicle and many of the things I've done. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's in a period of my life where it's uphill right now. I mean, but you, I mean, you can mark when they get here. I work for the film festival. I'm the festival senior programmer, and I'm also the operations manager. That means I kind of oversee the production and the technical, you know, aspects of the festival. Prepay? Yep. Pre you guys bought tickets already? Yeah. Okay, great. You have bought tickets? Cool. It's crazy to see how it all comes together. This year, there are over 5,000 events. We like to say that we work 356 days for these nine days of the festival. There's a lot of things that we put into motion in that one day. It's like trying to figure out making sure all that stuff is happening from, you know, the taco meetup to, you know, making sure all the panel rooms are built correctly, making sure the theaters are built correctly. 
you know, there's just so many individual pieces to the puzzle. It's a crazy time. It'll be, if, if I approved it and I printed it, then it's just in the packet. I've always found it to try to look calm on the outside, even if I am stressed, because a lot of people are looking at you to see how they should be acting. Things happen where we have to kind of, you know, if you don't cry at least once, you're not working hard enough. And so that definitely happens usually to everyone, at least uh, once a year. I was uh, a biochem major at UT. You know, for many years, I was going towards trying to get into med school, and in my final year, um, I had to start doing PR work in hospitals. So that meant going into hospital rooms and asking the patients how their hospital stays had been. And uh, you know, after two weeks of that, I decided to change my life completely. Hi. Hey, Jared. The opening night film is a big red carpet. It's a big night, and so it's stressful. Opening night's always like the one moment where you build up this whole year of working. I'm always in the back of the theater at the Paramount. Watching the, the bumper play in front of the film and then watching the film start, it's just like this, this moment, you know, in the 12 years I've been doing this. It's, uh, it always just kind of brings you, you know, goosebumps and chills. I never say I'm a Texan, but I always feel very proud of being a Texas filmmaker. I'm the producer and director of Arts in Context, which is a documentary series on KLRU, Austin PBS. It's mainly about the process of creating art. Art crew is anywhere from like one person, me, to like three, four people. The best part is the process, for sure. It's so like an a spiritual experience sometimes, that you are allowing to people's spaces. And the only reason I was allowed it is because I was holding the camera. I always wanted to have kids. My wife always wanted to have kids. We decided we were gonna have a baby, first baby. And then we lost the baby. So that was probably the toughest time, losing that first baby, because we were not prepared for it. You know, people don't talk about it. And then it happened, and then you realize, oh, it happens to everybody. And then, okay, now let's try it again, and then you lose it again, and then you try it again, and then you lose it again. And then you lose five babies in a row. It was hard. And that's why having our first baby was such a high point. That was a big, big accomplishment. And then after that, it's like, well, now everything is possible. Now it's like production just multiply every year. Like having a second baby, productivity duplicates. You are so tired, now I'm about to have another baby and I have so many projects lined up. I never follow the easy path. I've never taken shortcuts ever in my life. But I was confident that I was going to get somewhere. So the destination is what matters. You know, just figure out what it is that you want to do. And then know that you can do it. At this point, we have two, maybe three classes, including the final left. Most people should be at the point where you have completed all your ideas. I'm an Irish person. That's, there's just no hiding it. But I'm, I do consider myself an awesome night. Here is home. I'm supposed to be here. I'm the head of the visual art department at Cabelli, and I teach all the studio art classes. I'm very fortunate to do what I love to do in a place that really supports it. A lot of students growing up now, their experience of art is primarily through the computer and the digital world. I find that Traditional handmade art skills are something that they really value and they see as almost exotic because they rarely get to experience uh, that kind of creativity. Some people, I think, have the idea that art and creativity in general are just branches of the entertainment industry rather than something that can be intrinsically valuable to a whole person and their education and that are transferable to all kinds of other disciplines. That's something that art teachers are fighting against all the time. 
Teaching, I give as, as much or more time to it as my studio practice. Each one informs the other. Personally, my artwork is, I think, the best it's been since, since I was four, when I made really, really good artwork. At this school, the kids are generally really talented and motivated and interested. Uh, so that provides it, its own unique challenge and that I have to step up and operate at the same level as the students' interest. You know, I'm a crusty old Irish person. That's what, what I am. That's what the kids see and hear. And that's all right. Austin is the best place to be, I feel like. The best part of Texas, dare I say. And I really identify with this whole Austinite thing of putting yourself out there and being who you are. I find all these little restaurants and snow cone stands and little, I don't know, pockets of Austin. And I think that's really cool to grow up in such a safe and accepting place. I've got to see the school grow and change, and I've been with the same people that I'm here with now for my entire life, which is really valuable. So if you remember the words for adding negative interest. I do a whole lot of creative writing and different stories, and I try and write songs. I really feel like I want to try and express myself to the world since this is a place where I can do that and not be judged. I really love being 12 right now. Of course, technology and the media, I feel like it's really straining girls, especially with all the stereotypes and standards of society. But right now, I wouldn't want to be any other age. I want to stay young forever and just enjoy my life how it is. I'd call myself a leader. I'm usually the loud, extravagant one. I'm friends in a group of introverts. I'm that wild party animal in our group. Is statistics chapter four or chapter five? Four. Some people perceive me as being the A-plus student all the time, so that if I get a C on a quiz, then it's suddenly a big deal. And sometimes that's a really hard standard to live up to. There are always uncertainties about myself, but I know that I try my best, and that's something that I definitely feel good about. I think I'm in the phase where I'm really trying to figure out who I am. Because I'm not entirely sure yet, but I'm definitely making progress, finding out what I love to do and who I love and all of that. I really like to be something in writing. At one point, I want to be a trapezist, just to see what that would be like, experience that before I die. I'm not really sure where I would be right now if I didn't have my relationship with ballet. When I dance, I can let everything go. I came from a really troubled family, and it was really hard for me to connect with anything at a very young age. My father ended up leaving my family when I was about four years old. And I think that that, in a way, carved out what sort of expectations I had for myself. I really craved to be successful in my own way. Definitely through dancing, I feel that I have become successful. In a way, dance actually makes me feel sort of invincible, like I can do anything. As a kid, I was like, I felt almost like I was a superhero, really. It was an escape, and it was also a way to sort of find value in myself and find my worth. I am a trainee here at Ballet Austin. We are a separate group from the main company and second company. It's one of the most difficult things I've ever encountered. The day typically starts with a ballet class from 9 in the morning to 10.30, and then you have rehearsals and additional classes throughout the rest of the day. So it's very rigorous, but very rewarding at the same time. I'm starting to come out of my shell and really approach myself as a true artist. I don't feel like I'm in Texas, really. I feel like just from my experiences in Austin, you can feel welcomed wherever you go, and that's not something you experience in every city. 
I just feel really at home here. I've been riding pedicabs cabs a little over three years. I actually started uh, when I was 18 years old, still a senior in high school. We do work off of tips. Most pedicabs, if you ask them, will want somewhere in the range of $5 per passenger for a ride just in the downtown area. This is enough to pay my rent, utilities, and food. This is my one paying job. I'm also a full-time student, so that, that takes up most of my time. I'm a history major, probably looking at grad school here in the future. Being born and raised here when almost none of my peers are from here, then it gives me a strange sense of pride to say, no, you know what, I, I'm from here, I grew up here. I know this place well and I, and I love it. For the longest time, I planned on going to school and getting out and going right into the teaching profession, but I've since reconsidered that and said, you know what, I want to put a couple years between graduation and, and you know, finding that job. The, the bottom line is I want to spend a couple years just sort of growing up a little, then I can sort of get more serious about, about life in general. I certainly fear, and I'd say I, I would guess that most people fear this, uh, just things not working out. Not necessarily things not going the way you plan them. Maybe they go a different way, and, but, but that works out. I'm just worried about nothing working out. I would say that I'm content because I live a relatively simple life. It's not really full of many complications, and if there's one thing I don't like, it's, it's needless complications, and so I feel like I've at least succeeded in that. I was driving by and I remember seeing the Dura School Hotel. I was like, I have to go in there. I didn't even have an interview or anything. I just kind of walked in and I was like, this is where I'm going to work. This place inspires me every day to be more creative and hone my craft even more. I don't pre-plan menu items. I just kind of look at what I got in that day and, and start creating from there. I pick an ingredient and then build off of that. When everyone gets in, we kind of take a look at that what new product we have in that day, and then we kind of just start making our daily menu changes from there. Once that final menu is printed out, it's taped down final, for, ready for service. Okay. It's a controlled chaos when we open a little bit. I love being in this atmosphere. That's kind of, kind of who I am. Uh, I love the intensity. I grew up on a ranch in Arkansas for a few years, and as a kid, I remember I was always in there Sunday mornings with my mom, milking the cows and then making ice cream. Friday night, and we do 100 covers, and they all order five course. So you're looking at a good 500 plates. I love it when it's busier. The busier the better. I'm, I think I'm more creative when it's busy. A smoothly running kitchen is, is pretty much set up like a military brigade. I didn't have that discipline growing up, so definitely helped me in my, outside my life is having that structure in my life. At least three or four people are working on each dish. My saute guy, he cooks the sides, vegetables, starches. My grill guy, he cooks the, all the proteins, whether it's the halibut or the prime ribeye that we do it here in house. And that goes on the plate and then it goes to me. I'm the last point of contact for all plates, so saucing, garnishing, wiping plates, and checking for seasoning. We need hands for table 18, please. What really makes me happy is just seeing other people being happy. That's, I think, why I got into cooking is I, I noticed the immediate results you got from, from feeding someone. Christianity that we would see in America, for the most part, is Western Christianity. They're all coming from a very similar perspective. The Eastern Church has a different approach. 
It's less intellectual per se and more experiential. Very little has changed in the last thousand years other than perhaps what language we're doing things in. Orthodox worship is very sensory. It involves all of our senses. We use incense, we have chanting. Uh, we don't use musical instruments. Everything is sung by the human voice. We have people from virtually every Orthodox background that you can imagine. We have, of course, Lebanese, Syrian, Palestinians, Iraqis, but we also have Russians, Ukrainians, Serbians, Romanians, Bulgarians, Greeks. We also have uh, Ethiopians and Eritreans in our parish as well. And in, in addition to that, a lot of uh, Texans who have uh, embraced the Orthodox faith as well. It's something that, can, that is really a part of our culture here, even in Austin, in Texas, that even Texans like me can embrace. All slips of looking the kingdom of God. I've been a priest for 25 years now. As a young priest, you're just trying to figure out what you're doing. I think at this point in my life, I've become more knowledgeable of who people are. So perhaps at this point, maybe, maybe I'm ready to be a pastor, even though I've been one for 25 years. Of course, you asked me that in 15 years, I might tell you the same thing then. And I'll look back on now and say, oh, I was just totally deluded, I had no idea. GSCNM, the agency we founded 41 years ago, we started the business right out of school. None of us had any advertising experience at all. I think Austin has been our blessing because we grew up together. In Austin, I think this environment allowed us to incubate and feel confident. When we did Don't Mess With Texas, it was an anti-litter campaign. Litter dropped 76%. With no fines, with no penalties, with no big brother. We got out of the litter business and laddered up to the pride business. And we started looking at that and we went, that's purpose. We were able to find companies that are in the business of making a difference and market that difference. The number one job of a leader is to always protect the troops. And sometimes the mistakes I made was, well, you know, we'll go take those guys on. You know, we have no fear. And a lot of times it paid off, but sometimes I knew we were going to lose and went in to, to pitch the business anyway. There's a difference between failing and coming up short. I didn't realize this until recently. Coming up short is you, you give your best and you just don't get there. Failing is character. Don't go out and do something when you're destined to lose. Don't try to be right when you're wrong. Because you know what? No creative person has ever been in a thing like that. I found that I have to be responsible. So I get up at four in the morning and work and work and work. So I'm afraid of letting people down. Ann Richards, governor of Texas, loved this woman. She'd always come up to me on the trail, see that white hair, and she'd come kiss me on the cheek and she'd say, now precious, get over it and get on with it. So that's a good way to live life. Get over it, get on with it. Don't let yesterday take too much of today. Well, since it's you, Lewis, you get a, you get a choice between the baton and the taser. See, I, I, and a lot of people say that you don't have a big heart. Uh, was it just that you were out of pops, feeling your own space? A reading from the Holy Ghost, according to St. Paul. To find out more about this one square mile and others, visit our website at osmtx.com. One Square Mile, Texas is brought to you by Southwest Airlines, flying the Texas skies since 1971.
and community partners in square miles from coast to coast. Southwest Airlines is proud to support One Square Mile, Texas. More information at southwest.com. Texas Photo Montage, featuring the cultural images of Texas. Available online at texasmontage.com.